Once upon a time, there was a man who was going to become the king. He was in a land far, far away, and he'd been waiting to become king for such a long time. His mother, you see, had been on the throne for ages, ages and ages. He'd been desperate to become the king, but he had to wait. And she was very popular with all the subjects. And this sort of disturbed him a little bit, and he was rubbing his hands, going, oh, blimey, she's so good as the queen. How will I ever do it? You see, he was quite elderly at the point when the queen actually popped her clogs, and he wasn't going to be king for terribly long. And at early, in his early stages, he'd been a pretty good prince, really. He'd been into organic farming. He'd been smiling a lot and t talking to trees and, and being sort of thoroughly jolly old chap, really. Although there was something a little bit weird about him. Maybe it was the ears and perhaps his breakup of marriages and maybe some of the lies he used to say. But anyway, he, was a, he seemed to be an all right sort of chap, I guess. But as his mother got elderly, he seemed to himself, as his kingship was approaching, got into some rather bad company, as so many of this family seemed to do. And uh, he got himself in with some very dubious people who were interested in a, a top-down government that would rule the whole world, it seemed. Anyway, uh, when the time came and the day came and he was thinking, hmm, I'm going to be now the king, he had to be coronated. He had to go and, and stand in an abbey and make a vow to all the people, say an oath, and talk to a number of uh, very important folk. And it was going to be exciting when he had the crown put on his head. But this crown, you see, was not really a real crown, was not a proper gold crown as you and I might imagine. It was, it was more like a paper-thin crown. You see, this crown had been sold oh, many years ago in a previous king and had to sell it after a certain war because the money had run out and they were getting desperate. They didn't tell everybody what had happened. And they sold this crown and the whole estate to the bankers. You see, these bankers that were running everything, they lived in a, a square mile in the city. And they turned this square mile into their own country. In fact, it wasn't even part of the other land. It was, it was their own land. And yet, because they bought the Crown Estate, they effectively owned the king. And this man, who was soon to become king, uh, and indeed his mother, could not enter this square mile without asking permission. And it was strange because the bankers would often laugh at them and say, ha, ha, look at this strange juxtaposition. There you are, the king or the queen uh, of your land, and yet we really are the rulers, for we have the money, you see, and without the money, you are nothing. Anyway, these bankers, who were a pretty awful lot, they were also into all sorts of other strange things. They, they funded other things like uh, think tanks across the world to help this, this very odd top-down government uh, take people's sovereignty and things like that, really. But they also funded another bunch of people uh, for some time, about 300 of them, in a place called Mitterly. At least I think it was Mitterly. Admittedly, it could have been somewhere else, but similar sounding name. Anyway, this club that they had uh, funded, the Club of Dome, was it Dome? Anyway, this club, uh, these bunch of people, these were a real miserable bunch of people. Oh yes, they, one day they got together and they said, you know what, I think there's just too many people in this world, far too many people. You know, they're sort of useless eaters going around not doing very much. If we're not careful, they're going to have all the land and populate like rabbits. Not sure we want that. And they all concurred and they said, well, what can we do? And he said, well, what we should do really, basically, just get rid of them. Just get, just get shot of them. So they came up with all sorts of schemes to do this over the years. This was quite a long, long process. They'd thought about uh, inoculations for children. If they could sort of give them these, I think they were called RRM inoculations. I may have got the numbers the wrong way around, uh, or indeed the letters. But anyway, the point of these inoculations was to ensure that these children suffered all sorts of mental problems, autism and schizophrenia and ADHD and things like that, which made it very awkward for parents and indeed the children themselves, of course. 
And other things that they uh, funded and planned on was to put sort of strange particulates into the air to sort of effectively dim the sky so that plants wouldn't grow. Uh, they did things like shoving all sorts of poisons into the water. Very, very subtle, you see, very subtle over time, these poisons, so that people would get strange sort of cancers and other issues and problems, and, and it would make people very ill, and, and of course that wasn't nice. Another thing they did was to ensure that the farming community would uh, start making sure there was plenty of antibiotics and all sorts of uh, pesticides and things onto the plants, which would get into the soil and into the water and, and basically into the food, and, and that again would slowly poison people one way or another and make them ill. But this wasn't working quick enough for the the club of dome and they and they thought I know what we'll do we'll we'll cause some sort of big virulent virus that would be the thing yes and uh, because there would be this awful problem we'll we'll come up with a solution we'll come up where everybody has to take some sort of medical intervention the whole population and um, the result of that would be that uh, between naught and say 10 years people would get extremely ill some would die on the spot and just actually collapse on the floor and others would have all sorts of weird effects you know blood clots and uh, strokes and all sorts of other problems limbs not working and fits and things like that that of course wouldn't be able to be traceable back to the club of dome anyway these were just these rather miserable people in the background that seemed to be telling the king and the queen and all of those people what to do Anyway, that was a sort of a, all a bit of an aside, really, and the king, the man who was going to be king, he, uh, he had to obey them, but nobody was supposed to know this, you see, and that was the point of this coronation, to make out that he still was the king, the ruler of this land. Anyway, the day came, and it was a miserable day, actually. It was raining. It was pretty miserable. But the king was excited. Him, He was excited. He thought, I'm going to get coronated. I'm going to have this crown on my head, and then my subjects will all bow down to me. It's all going to be great, and, and I can set up these, these awful things that I've got planned. You see, it wasn't a particularly nice bloke. Anyway, <clears throat> he got out of bed went out to look out the window of his palace, and there beyond the gates in the far, far distance there were crowds of people. What he didn't realise, as they were waving their flags and smiling and holding their banners and saying, long live the king and all of this, is they were, of course, they were, came from rent -a -mob. They were just actors and actresses all sort of playing parts. But the, this man who was to be king hadn't really realised that. There might have been a few people who were silly enough to believe that he was a a nice sort of chap, and they looked forward to him to be king. And uh, he put on the wireless to hear about the presentations and the television and the mainstream media, of course, were saying how marvellous it was going to be, what an incredible day it was going to be, and how people were looking forward to this wonderful king. And he was so pleased that the subjects had fell into the deception, and it was all going swimmingly. And uh, the various people came and said, OK, Your Majesty, we, we now need to take you to the Abbey where you'll be coronated. And at this coronation, of course, there was uh, the, great, the great moment where he would swear his oath and allegiance to those people, uh, to the old customs and the traditions. He would have his fingers crossed during that process because he didn't mean, a, didn't mean any of that. And then when the anointment came and he had this special magic oil that was there to be smothered all over him, he would be behind a screen, discreet, nobody would see, and that's when he would take a second oath, the oath to the bankers, to these people, the people of the Club of Dome and the various other think tanks that he was really in allegiance with. But nobody would know that. They'd made some pretense of the reason they had to have this, this moment where he would be secluded for the ointment thing and, of course, the, <clears throat> the oath-taking. Anyway... That was to, yet to happen. And he got into his carriage, golden carriage, and he came down this long line, all the people waving their flags and smiling. Although the smiles didn't look terribly real, to be honest with you. They looked like they were fake, as if somebody had paid people to smile. And there was a newspaper seller right at the end, and he said, stop the carriage, stop the carriage, my man. I, I want to see how the rest of the country is celebrating this wonderful day that I shall be king. 
and the uh, footman there, or the, the man who drives the carriage, the coach driver, he said, no, 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 we don't really have time. He said, no, nonsense, we must have time. Give me a newspaper, young man, I, I want a newspaper. And the, the gentleman selling the newspapers handed him a paper. He said, all right, Majesty. And he looked in the king, the man who was to be king, he looked in the paper and he went, oh, this is all, there's pictures of me and there's pictures of, wait, where's all the celebrations? He couldn't quite see all the celebrations and he went through the papers and there were photographs of empty streets and, and no bunting and the words cancellation and not interested and disappointing and not really the man we want and, and things like that. All these events across the land that had been promised that were going to be marvellous had been cancelled, you see, that nobody seemed to be bothered, and the king looked desolate. Anyway, he had to go, and he went off to have his coronation. But the truth of the matter was that the rest of the population weren't really interested in what was happening in this abbey with the king that was going to be crowned. You see, they'd made other arrangements. They were sitting in front of the fire on this wet, miserable day, knitting. Or some of them had ventured out to tend to their animals. Others were ploughing the fields and others were just getting on with their real life. You see, the thing is, there comes a point where the truth will come out, that people see through the deception, that people will see what is real, they won't put up with the lies anymore. You see, it seemed to the rest of the people that this man who was so desperate and wanted to be king and had caused so much trouble, including this rather hefty medical intervention, wasn't really the king that they wanted. He wasn't the man that they liked. He seemed an old, evil, disheveled liar. And nobody, nobody could be bothered.